Good song. That's a good song. All right, it's 10.30. Hey, everybody. Uh, it is 10.30. We're going to wait another minute and let some latecomers join because if we know one thing about musicians is that they're always late. So we're going to give it about a minute and a half, maybe just a minute, and then we'll uh, get started. So enjoy this tune uh, while we wait. Don't be shy. Log on. You all know him. Yeah, this music is good. Yeah. I like things that are good. All right. Well, that's enough of that. Great job, Natalie. Thanks Not for good. joining us today. Yeah, great job, Natalie. You sound wonderful. Uh, you're joining us today. Welcome to Church Next webinar. And um, we have a lot of great stuff in store for you today. Uh, if you have comments or questions throughout the webinar, please put them in the chat and we will address those as much as we can. And we hope that you can become part of the conversation and not just a consumer like much of the world. Perfect. Uh, we're joined today. I want to just introduce some folks to you. My name is Adam Countryman. I'm the owner of Countryman Consulting, and I am the music worship arts director thingy from Concordia in San Antonio. So I'm glad that you're here joining us today. Also, Phil Grimpo is with us again. Thank you, Phil. Phil is the owner and operator of Inspire Media Productions. If you're not using Inspire Media for your production, church, install, or whatever, you are making an enormous mistake. So Phil's kind of, um, he's helping us out today. He's, he may jump in here and there, but he's also going to be running some media for us here on the Church Next webinar. Also, we're joined today by Dave Madden, who is a brother in music to me. And um, we have worked together for uh, about 20 years, almost 20 years now. Yeah, And um, we've done a lot of uh, amazing things and we've lived in a lot of different places really and, amazing uh, things <laughs> really amazing things another great amazing another great thing. which today will also be a great amazing thing so we're looking forward to that um we've also done just a, a bunch of different things if you're part of lcms which a lot of you who are watching possibly are then you may recognize um some of these clips that we're going to show you right now just as an example Dave and I co-wrote the theme song for the 2016 National Youth Gathering, and it was uh, called Christ Alone. And so I think Phil's got a little clip he's going to remind us of, of that tune. Eventually. There it is. If you were there, this was amazing. Oh, yeah. Get ready. Oh, 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 oh yeah, the cell phone technology. Mm -hmm. A real small room. Yeah. Hey, those people are not socially distancing. No. I, find my I think that company that made that cell phone app's out of business now. Alone, yeah, I mean, there was no practical application for it at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. So that was a great time. Dave and I co-wrote that song, and it was an awesome. Uh, somebody said the call and response was the best. Mm. So thank you, Facebook user. I agree. 
Um, yes. That was a great time. You know, when Dave and I wrote that tune, um, we stood in my garage office and Dave said, I think the best way to do this is to jump up and down and that's how we get the tempo because that's what we want all the kids doing. And I yeah. will forever remember that as a great idea. We, we went, we stood there together and I went, okay, you're a 15 year old kid from a small town. You're in this big room. Let's jump up and down. That's probably what they would do. So, and what was, what's the tempo for of a kid jumping up and down like 136 or something? Yeah, BPM? I, I don't remember. I think it's 136. I haven't jumped since. So we got back into that in 2019, and uh, Dave and I teamed up again to run a song for 2019. We all came up with this idea of um, this opening single piece with uh, this guy named Hey Ray's here, and he's going to show you this. So we're going to show hey you a little Ray. clip of that as well as we get started today. This whole beginning was scored out by Dave. It's a great idea of like an orchestra tuning up. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I remember those boom, boom, boom. They were like pillars, like musical pillars to kind of connect everything together. That's right, yeah. Between this and the song, too. Right? Mm -hmm. Gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam. Though oh, the he's electric. And it's swelling, real. Yeah. God. Electric. Boogie, woogie, woogie. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Real, present God. Yeah, he keeps saying that real, present God. And it's very um, unfortunate, uh, inconvenient that the word present has two syllables. Like, yeah, if the next gathering planners could just do three words, one syllable each, that would really help us out. It would be great. It's all about us. Real. <laughs> like now, present, like now, like real now, God, that would have been much easier. It doesn't make any sense. Well, I guess uh, it yeah. It's fine. He makes war seeds to the end of the earth. So this is building up into what will be the theme song. If you were there, you remember this. It, it kind of built an intensity in the room. It was super energetic in the stadium, incredibly intense with this thing just building and building and building. Yeah. Amazing. Ray did a great job. Ray did an amazing job. Yeah. Inspire Media did a great job putting this video together. This editing is amazing. It really is, yeah. I mean, if you're into video stuff, which I'm not personally, I don't like video, but if you if you like video, then it's very good. Oh, there we are. Oh, fire. Very deep and detailed lyrics here. <laughs> Scripturally based. <laughs> Oh, call and response. Yeah, big surprise there. <laughs> Look out. All right. Well, that's good. We you, you know it from here. If you don't, you can look it up. Uh, it's, a, it's a great song. And um, it's awesome. You know, Dave just said something. It was, um, you know, deep lyrics and about the O's. And it reminded me of one of my favorite quotes. Don Henley was on a songwriting thing. At some point, Don Henley's from the Eagles. If you don't know that, uh, oh boy. Um, then, anyway, yeah. uh, he, somebody said, "What happens when you get writer's block?" And he just said, "There's rarely a good replacement for the word baby." <laughs> that was it. That was the whole thing. That was nice. Like, that's amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to move on, and um, I hope you enjoyed those clips. Maybe it took you back a little bit, gave you some nostalgic, some warm fuzzies or whatever. Um, but uh, we're going to dive into this idea of music in the church. Uh, I want Dave to introduce himself. And Dave, can you give us some background um, of you and kind of growing up and how you came into this deal? And for those of you who don't know, there's a, a Dave Madden Day in Austin, Texas that was declared by the mayor. Uh, he's award-winning there in the in the live music capital of the world. Is um, he's won best arranger and best keyboardist and so on and so forth. Um, so, Dave, kind of talk us through who you are and 
all that kind of crap. I mean, stuff. I mean, whatever. Sorry. Uh, yeah, glad to be here. Long time listener, first time caller. Uh, I'll take my answer off the air. And uh, the first <laughs> thing that needs to be said uh, about my musical path is that I had an endlessly supportive um, mom and have an endlessly supportive mom. It kind of started in the family and then eventually in the church. I would get a lot of experience playing music in the church, but um, I think mom might be tuning in too. So thanks, mom. Hi, ma'am. Who took me to all the, uh, you know, the piano lessons, the marching band stuff, the high school musical stuff, the choir uh, stuff. And we had an upright piano in the house and I started taking piano lessons at eight and trombone at 10 and guitar at about 13 and uh, bass and guitar together at about 13 or 14 and drums around 16 and had a good couple piano teachers who made sure to be teaching me about music theory, ear training, music history, and giving me kind of like a well-rounded education. So I'm very grateful for that. And at the same time, I was kind of diving into early finale notation software, which I think is up to version 26 now. And I think I remember working on version three when I was like 12 years old. Um, so I was doing that and I was dabbling with primitive multi-track recording gear. Um, we got like a Tascam MK2 cassette recorder thing. So I was writing songs and recording parts all by myself. And of course, looking back, I now know that everything that I was doing was the wrong way and sounded awful, but I didn't know it at the time. And it was a great education. So around when, uh, 14 years old, I start, <clears throat> started playing at my church's first uh, contemporary worship service. This is Messiah Lutheran in a little town in Pennsylvania. And I uh, started playing piano for that. It was called 103 Alive, based on Psalm 103 and that contemporary It's a real churchy service. name for a, for a new contemporary service, right? 103 Alive, Alive in all capital, and then uh, an exclamation mark at the end. You know, just like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, nailed it. <laughs> what was the font that everybody was using back? Papyrus? Papyrus? It was probably in pa Papyrus font. It probably was. <laughs> um. You know, and I was learning the, to... the name on my door is still in papyrus, by the way. So, yeah. You know, it's a very thing. Yeah. And the, of course, anyway. the the wider secular culture has moved on like 20 years ago, which that's the church <laughs> is always 20, 20 years behind in every capacity. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, piano lessons raised in the church, went to Berkeley where I met you, Adam, uh, Berkeley College of Music in Boston and uh, music, music, music all the time. It's all I've ever done. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. You know, um, a couple years back, well, I guess a few years back now, um, Dave was invited to do a TED talk. And um, I think we're going to post the uh, link to that in the chat. And um, uh, yeah, we're going to post that in the chat, Phil, if you can. And as I understand it, my signal is kind of gets bad sometimes, but good others. And that must be... Um, something that's happening on my end and i apologize for that uh stick with us and hopefully the good outweighs the bad um yeah there's the youtube link there to the ted talk and this is uh called i dave was this was the talk was called down the rabbit hole i think or something like that yeah um it's a music theory nerdery uh odyssey down down the rabbit hole into kind of the deeper inner workings of music it's 18 minutes long. It has kind of a five minute performance at the end. It talks about how melody and harmony and rhythm are all kind of interconnected through frequency. So super nerdy music stuff. And if that interests you, then go check it out. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. I've seen it a few times and um, it's, it's great. So yeah, go check it out. You'll be surprised by a lot of it, even if you're just kind of a novice. All right. Well, let's look now at, you know, we're, we've been in this whole thing with the, the you know, um, COVID crap and all that. And everybody's been trying to figure things out and do things differently. I want to talk about what music, uh, you know, does it look different now? And then moving forward, what does it look like? So um, not just in the church, but I think uh, because music is such a big part of our worship experience, uh, certainly it affects that. So, you know, Dave, what differences do you notice uh, in terms of live music versus online? And is like, what are those main kind of 
differences, those tent post differences that, that occur. There's all the obvious stuff, right? Um, we're performing into directly into cameras, which some people in church worship may have already been familiar with. Maybe you were already used to looking into a camera at the back of the room for some kind of an online broadcast. Now we're kind of all doing that. Um, there's the different way that we're putting music together. We might be putting music together kind of throughout the week. Uh, and it just feels different, of course, hugely different to not be performing live to uh, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people in a room. There's that lack of energy in the room. However, I will say this, that I feel like some other art forms other than music might have it worse. Like if anybody out there has been watching, especially the early days of the stay at home orders, watching the late night talk show guys, the Colbert and Fallon and all them, mm -hmm. man, that was a train wreck. The first like three or four nights, they were a fish out of water because their art form relies so heavily on the call and response between them telling a joke or making some kind of a funny observation and then the crowd responds. I mean, and they kind of ride that wave. And when that was taken away from them, they have never done that. They just don't know how to do that. Now, music, here's a kind of an ironic truism about a, a great musician. If you ever see a great musician standing up on some big stage, right? So we saw some clips of us playing at the US Bank Stadium. One thing that's always true about that musician is there was a time in the past where they were isolated for like 10 years, meaning they locked themselves in their bedroom and they practiced the bass guitar alone. That can only happen alone. I mean, later you get to be good at music and play with other musicians, but there's this time of isolation. So for me, the thought of um, performing the piano or the guitar, or whatever, passionately and emoting with nobody present and just by myself, it's like, I've been doing that my whole life. I don't really need there to be an audience there because when I was a kid, when in my 20s up until now, I know how to do that. I know how to sit there and play until I sweat. And it's not that weird for me to do that. Yeah, I think we're seeing that with pastors as well. Um, you know, they are used to a response from the people who are in the room. Right. And when that doesn't happen, now they have to change how they're communicating. Um, and those who aren't are, you know, not good. Not as good. Good. I also anymore. wanted to, so I wanted to kind of take this question, which I think is a great question and go in a little bit of a weird direction. So stay with me here. There's this quote that I want to share with everybody. It's Pablo Picasso. And if you don't know who Pablo Picasso is, um, he was good friends with Don Henley. <laughs> so, um, and this quote says this. He says, we all know that art is not truth. Art is a lie that makes us realize truth. At least the truth as we see it. The artist must know the manner whereby to convince others of the truthfulness of his lies. So what he's kind of saying there, right, is that art is a lie, or perhaps a kinder way to say that is that art is a story that we tell. It's not the truth. It's a story about the truth. And I think that can mean a lot of different things for different art forms. But in the context of what we're talking about here today, look, when you put reverb on your voice, that's a lie. You're not really singing in large concert hall number two, right? You're, <laughs> you're actively telling a lie to everybody in order to tell this greater truth. When you tune I, I your- I agree with you. <laughs> <It's quite enough. laughs> nice. Phil, we didn't even practice that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, thanks Phil. When you tune your vocal digitally in a recording, that's a lie. When a drummer records their drum part first and then later the bass player multi-tracks, that's a lie. In fact, like whatever your people tuning in, you, um, your favorite song in the world, that never happened. Your favorite song never happened. There was never a time when those five musicians all sat in a room together and played that song, you know? So the thing that you love most in the world is a lie. Sorry. So now with being online and through the evil power of video and video is definitely evil. Um, we're, we're being given the opportunity to lie to the ones that we love more now than ever. Um, we're pre-recording content on Tuesday at 3 p.m. and then playing it on Sunday morning and saying, good morning, church, happy Sunday to you. I mean, that's a lie, but it's a lie that's helping us tell a story. So that is all to say that, you know, it's different, but it's not different. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great, a great point. You know, Phil actually in some of the past webinars has been talking about, you know, what happens when you have to go back to doing things live? Like, are you, are you ready to do that now that you've upped the quality or you've upped the experience so much? Right. So I want to talk a little bit specifically to music. Uh, Dave, you're a great arranger and have been doing that for, you know, ever, but mm -hmm. what adjustments do you make arranging wise or mixing wise? You know, do you, do you adapt music based on the idea that the sonic quality is going to be different now? You're not in a big room. You're listening through an iPhone speaker. And does that change? Should it change? You know, all those kinds of things. So in a perfect world, everything is the best that it can be. I mean, that's kind of an obvious thing to say, but a church would have the resources to have great video, great transitions, great audio. Um, that being said, if you if there aren't unlimited um, resources and time and personnel to make that happen, um, I don't have the answer here. I've been talking to my colleagues and peers and some guys are saying it's all about the audio quality and the video doesn't matter that much. You know, if the video is too high, um, too high resolution, then you get lag with the video. So who cares if it's blurry video, but it sounds great. And then other people take the complete different tack and say, yeah, really, who cares about the audio? Um, as far as the arranging piece of that goes, I have found that so the larger the kind of what I call Brady Bunch videos, right? So a grid video where you have a grid of musicians, you've got three or four singers, you've got a rhythm section, and everybody is self quarantining. So they're recording these parts at home in order to not be recording them in a recording studio together. And I'm trusting that everybody out there kind of has some idea of what I'm talking about, right? A grid of, of musicians on there. I found that um, the way to hold people's attention is that I'm like producing a five or six minute long video, which is very long, but that it is divided up into almost a couple different musical moments. Maybe there's a 45 second kind of intro where somebody is speaking, inviting the listener to enjoy this music that's coming up. Then it switches over to the first vocal for 90 seconds or something like that. Then there's some kind of a, a guitar solo or a feature piece. And then maybe it's a medley that goes into a whole second thing. So it's kind of one six minute production, but it's also three or four little ones that kind of help. Um, mm -hmm. I think that holds people's attention a little bit better. And I found a little, some luck with that. Yeah. So that speaks to, you know, I, I think we are in a place of attention span, right? And we have a deficit right. of that if you're sitting in a room, you're waiting for, if you're at a concert, you're waiting for the new song to go to the bathroom. Your attention is held until that point. Same thing with the, um, with the church, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to wait until a certain part of the service before I step out and yeah. use the restroom or take my kids to the you know, nursery or whatever the case is. But attention span online is totally different because you can walk away at any time with impunity. Like nobody cares because mm -hmm. nobody and knows what you're doing. And so you can tune how do you in. Hold you can, their attention? Yeah, it's it's very different, isn't it? And even the the thought of a visitor, a visitor to your to your church. I mean, it was a pretty big hurdle uh in the pre days, in the old the olden times. Pretty big hurdle to get somebody to come to your church. But if they did they weren't going to come for 90 seconds and then leave. I mean, they were going to stay for 45 minutes or the hour or whatever. Now on Facebook or wherever, you know, wherever you're streaming, people can kind of like pop in, pop out. I mean, just that yeah. quickly. So maybe that's not good. Maybe, maybe that can be an opportunity. Yeah. Well, I think it goes to speak to the audience, right? I mean, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is intentionality and lens. Who's your audience? Who are you talking to? Are you just talking to people that have been in your seats before? Or are you talking to now these hundreds, thousands of potential viewers that have not been there before and don't know who you are? <clears throat> so I think that's a great, a great point. Yeah, and, and maybe just one practical detail there would be as you're preparing your video uh, content and your stream, keep in mind that like right now, somebody tunes into this. 
there is a church next background with words there's a church next logo up in the corner there's both of our names on there uh so if somebody just tunes in for 10 seconds i think that's going to hold their attention a little bit more because already they're getting a little bit of the who what when where why how i mean they're those those answers are being filled in a little bit more than they tune in a guy's in the middle of a sentence. There's no words on the screen. They don't know who this person is. They don't know what they're talking about. Their phone goes off, they're distracted and they're gone. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and that is a great reminder for me to tell you all that if you have comments or questions throughout this time, please put them in the chat. We would love to address those and be able to, um, to have that conversation along with you while you're here watching. Uh, what about coming back to church and back to live venues? So does does this online medium then die once COVID dies and we're we're back now to this what we would call normalcy or you know what changes will happen in the industry, churches and other expressions of live art? Like will will they go back or will you know what should we be preparing for musically, you know, as music directors, as as leaders to say uh, this is going to be different, but what do we need to be thinking about musically as we head back into this uh, time of reopening or whatever? I mean, we're both in Texas, so we're at a point where things are starting to reopen. And uh, maybe that's earlier than some people that are watching right now, but it's inevitably it's going to happen. So can you speak to that a little bit, Dave, as the music professional in the room? Um, yeah, I'm no more of a music professional than Mr. Countryman here is, by the way. But so I do think it's useful to to realize that we're talking about two similar but different things, which is the sacred and the secular, because the church has a longer and deeper musical history that's kind of always been there. And by always, I mean 500 years or something. I mean, I know it goes back even further than that, but in some sense of the way that we understand what church music was in the pre-COVID times, that animal, that thing has existed in some context or another. Thank you. My beautiful wife bringing me a cup of coffee. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, she is a that beautiful is, wife. She is amazing. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so that has existed for longer than the secular normal picture that we think of. And I was talking to Adam about this um, yesterday. So, and I guess it's used to, it's useful even just as a kind of a creative thought experiment to, to go through this a little bit. The whole thing that we think of as normal music in our Western or American culture Right. There's some kind of a star with a good voice. They stand up on some stage which a with a bunch of pretty lights on them. They're wearing like a fancy outfit. They face one way. There's a bunch of other musicians maybe behind them. There's a big number of people in the audience and they're facing the opposite direction and looking at that person. Every 18 months, they release 11 songs onto either a physical media or a streaming platform. And that constitutes their kind of current body of work that they then tour on for, I mean, the whole thing, okay? That whole thing that we think of as normal, pop, popular music has existed for not that long. That whole monster hasn't been with us for that long. I was thinking about, uh, my mom was born in like 1945. Was she born into a house that had a vinyl player already in the house in 1945? I haven't asked her that question, but I'm thinking the answer is probably no. Um, maybe they got one later in the 50s or something. And then here I am, one generation later, um, I'm 37, going on 38 years old, and I also don't have a physical media player. I, mean, I don't have a vinyl player. I don't think I have a CD player anymore at all. So in the space of like two generations, the entire recording industry, the popular music industry as we know it rose and was crushed by, you know, new technologies coming along, the internet, Napster, whatever you want to call it. That to me, I think is just interesting to realize that the thing that we think is so normal has not been around for that long. The church goes back much further. 
So I do think it's going to be a lot easier for the traditional church music model to go back to the way it was because we've just had it for so long. So that was me going down maybe a little bit too deep of a rabbit hole there, but. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think that's a great thing for us to remember, you know, that this, the way we're used to our normal uh, hasn't been around that long. It's, it's come and gone uh, in a very short period of time. Right. I think it's important. You know, uh, we were talking a little bit um, yesterday about the idea that if you were a musician um, before that time existed, then you were either a church musician or you were a street musician. And those were really the only two options for you if you were a professional musician. Um, and yeah. that certainly has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's people who live, they lived in a very particular time. Maybe a guy, a piano player born in like mm, 1870 and died in 1935. That, that guy's entire career might have been based around the publication of sheet music. Right. Like that's all, that's all there was, you know, he didn't quite make it before we got like the Edison wax cylinder and then uh, into <laughs> vinyl recordings and everything. So that is just to say, I mean, that's super obscure, right. but that is to say that like, this has looked different before and it was fine and it's looking different right now. It's just very different, but it's fine. And it's going to look, I guess, different after this too. And that'll be fine too. I mean, we'll figure it out. Uh, the musicians, so the artists, and, speaking, yeah, the, the musicians Sorry, themselves I I cut, yeah. will, and I hope it's okay to say, will find a way to get screwed. I mean, somebody else is going to make the money, but it's not going to be the musicians. Um, I've <laughs> I no longer have any hope that you know there's going to be some income model where all of a sudden musicians are going to be the ones benefiting from uh, billions of people listening to their music. It's not going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. It's not going to happen next. So sorry. That's not, yeah, th not pessimistic, just realistic. It's not going to happen. Yeah. It's something that's been happening for in every model, uh, yeah. for a long time. So I don't think that's, that's a crazy thing to say. So what should musicians, worship leaders, uh, music directors, I mean, is there anything that they need to be thinking about differently when they come back or when they start to come back from online back into live? Man, I would turn that question back to you. I would actually love to know what you think about that. Um, you work with a huge number of musicians at Concordia at your church. They come and go. I mean, you're hiring people from outside of the church to come down from where I am from from Austin. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we're back to normal by Christmas, let's say, is it going to look the same as last year? Or what, what do you think about right. that? We didn't plan this, by the way. So uh, I wasn't setting me. myself up for, <laughs> for the glory of answering this question. I, I, you know, I think it will be different to some extent. Like our focus is not going to go away from being online. Right. I think that changes like what, what is your primary focus? You know, so I think that changes it. I also agree with what Leah Abel has said on this webinar channel before, which is whatever deficits you had going into this, those have been highlighted. Mm. So if if your music's been bad online, your music was bad in the room. Right. You know, and I think that's a, a reality that we all have to wrestle with. Online is is way less forgiving. Yeah. Right. Than it is in the room. So you've got this much less forgiving environment that has that's now being highlighted. And I think that can help us if we're willing to be honest and look at it and go, yeah, you know what? We're not that good because church musicians, I, like a lot of musicians and the egos and things that come along with that. I think there's a this idea that we're doing things well and right and good and whatever. But the reality is, is that a lot of a lot of us in the church, we're not that good at music. Like mm. we, there's a lot of church musician, people that have full-time jobs as church musicians and they come with the moniker. That's pretty good for church. Yeah. Right. But like, yeah. why have that moniker? Like, I just want it to be good. I like things that are good. 
right. Dave, you like things that are good. I enjoy things. That let's are good. let's yeah. strive toward getting things that are good and not just things that are good for church. You know, I think that's going to be the big thing because now the church is competing uh, for attention span with, uh, you know, a squirrel riding a bicycle on YouTube. Right. So, you know, it has to be good. Otherwise, people aren't going to stay like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And I, I that leads me to kind of what I, w- I want you to talk about next, if you would. And that is you've launched this thing at the beginning of the COVID um, isolation period for America. You launched this thing called the Isolation Congregation. Right. Now, I'm going to say this, and this is not pandering, and this is not something to give Dave a big head because, you know, he doesn't need any help with that. But No, I know. Uh, yeah, no, good. no. I mean, neither do I. Let's be honest. Yeah. But it is my favorite church. It, it has become the way that my family goes to church. We go to church on Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. Central Time. Wow. And we go to the isolation congregation and we sing hymns. And we, uh, we watched the children's portion of this thing. And I think that, you know, so you've, you've had a lot of past guests, right? So right. you've had, um, a U.S. congressman. Yeah. Lloyd Doggett. Who, who was that? Lloyd Doggett. Yeah. U.S. representative Doggett represents, uh, um, a region between Austin and San Antonio. Yeah. Yeah, and he's he's been a big um, supporter of the arts in general. Um, you know, which he's in a great district too. Yeah, be. we've also had um, an Austin city city of Austin council member Kathy Tovo, one of kind of like ten um, city districts that we have. She stopped by. We've had um, medical doctors come by and give kind of a on the front lines update to the isolation congregation. The people tuning in a doctor named dr anna vu wallace um who else we've had yeah. a bunch yeah well and you've had some some different pastors on i, I know the the head right. of the um iac the interfaith action community project yeah. there in Austin. reverend reverend dr stephen kinney we've had simone talma flowers who is the executive director of interfaith action central texas and we've had pastor bill tucker from concordia yeah, and those of you who've who've been a part of the um, of the youth gatherings for a while, you may remember Matt Popovitz. He was on and, and did the oh, yeah, Easter Matt. message as well. Right. So that was awesome. So d- well, talk thanks. to us a, a little bit, Dave, about um, I, well, you know what? Let's just show a clip here of, of uh, the isolation congregation. Phil, if you've got that, uh, that you can play for us the intro into thanks, uh, one Phil. of these songs. The isolation congregation. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the isolation congregation. My name is Dave Madden coming to you live from Austin, Texas. The isolation congregation. That's you. You're the isolation congregation, socially distanced at home and probably unable to go to Sunday meeting. But here we are. We're going to sing a lot of great music. This is a recent one. I think this is like last week, maybe. Your lyric sheet. You can download that lyric sheet. You can load it up with the link that is on your screen now. And it's going to have all the lyrics that we're going to sing together on the Isolation Congregation. That's what we're all about here. We're all about singing together. There's a lot of great musicians doing a lot of great live streams out there right now. But this one is special because we're really trying to make a choir of people all singing from wherever you're tuning in from. You're the congregation. Please get your lyric sheet so that you can sing along with us. Next, share the good news. If this is something that you think other people would enjoy, your friends, your family, then let them know about it. You can share this link on Facebook, share the whole live stream. You can tag the names of your friends and family in the comments and even if they don't find it now because they're still asleep or in a different time zone or something they'll find it (laughs) and they can watch the whole program this tv show is great (laughs) if they're in their underwear (laughs) because we save these feeds and we leave them on uh on social media for people to enjoy man you talk a lot finally it's so exhausting we will offer it really is it's exhausting we appreciate your generosity this Um, is an interesting piece here with the free will offering you know a lot of churches have had to change to online giving Mm -hmm. different things and this is a great example of that it's been a long time and y'all continue to be very generous with your support your financial yeah 
your offerings. Well, I'll just let him finish. Ways that are on your screen. <laughs> He's right. doing a great job. Dave, why don't you finish? <laughs> Excel, Venmo, Cash App, whatever is easiest for you. But I really do appreciate that. It helps me to keep going with this. Uh, shut up. <laughs> I just want to get to a song. Spread your generosity and your donations to others. It's going to be a while. Uh, well, you know, no, no, we're almost there. We're almost okay, there. we're yeah, we're almost to a song. And you know, part of the like five minute talk at the uh, beginning sure. is so that it gives people some time to see on their phone that this thing is going live and tune in and go to the bathroom and then come back or whatever. Download I try to the lyric sheet. Download the lyric sheet. I try to give them like four or five minutes at the top before we actually start singing. Excited to get. So I just go blah blah blah. I'm gonna start with this beautiful hymn. It's the same tune as the doxology. It's called. But uh, with different words, Ooh, doxology, words, yeah. injury words called all creatures of our God. I love this hymn. Hallelujah. What key am I in here? All creatures of our God and King lift up See? Yeah, I guess see. Thus and see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. That's good. Yeah. And, you know, the Nailed thing it. about this. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> the thing I love about that is that it's so simple. Yeah, it's very like, simple. You know, it's, it's just you talking to people who have tuned in and giving them information, giving them time to get situated and then singing this, you know, great uh, music together. So, you know, what was your whole point in doing this and how did you, you know, just decide to take on all this extra work for very little money? You're right. I should, I got to stop doing this. This is ridiculous. <laughs> it is so much work, even putting something so, um, as simple as that together. Um, so what is it? It's like eight songs with a heavy focus on traditional hymns like that or kind of Hank Williams Southern gospel. So we also do a little, a lot of, I saw the light. Um, what else do we do? Uh, I'm going to sit at the welcome table. Will the circle uh, be unbroken? Will the, yeah. Thank you. Will the circle be unbroken? Stuff like that. And some like his eyes on the sparrow. So this music that's very dated uh, for the musicians, like there's a lot of diminished chords in this music. It's got that 1930s, not all of it, you know, but some of it has that sound. Of course, a lot of this stuff is centuries old. Um, why why limit it? You know, I, I know you and I have had this discussion, but I think it'd be helpful for people. So many churches are doing the new thing, right? Like the new song, the new Hillsong, Bethel, Elevation, CCM, thing you said at the top of this well i'm gonna do the southern gospel thing with these old hymns and that's what i'm gonna stick to unless it's like a beatles tune or something else that has some kind of cultural relevance but mm -hmm. why why limit that like why choose that path instead of oh here's the new hot christian tune it wasn't a complicated decision it is simply the music that resonates more with me personally as a musician, I find it to be this, the older hymns and the Southern gospel stuff is like harmonically rich. It's fun to play. I think it's, um, it's fun to sing. It's also like, I think eh, in a weird way, it's harder to sing, but in a different way, it's easier to sing because it's in that format of stanza one, two, three, four for a hymn. Whereas for a lot of the newer CCM stuff, it's, you have to learn a verse, you have to learn a chorus, you have to learn a bridge. A lot of people haven't heard that stuff. Um, I also think that like people tuning in, so Facebook friends of mine tuning in, they might know um, this little light of mine, they might know, will the circle be unbroken, not be, not be put off by it and just think that's great music. I mean, that's the way that church music used to be is that right. the, and it's almost not worth saying because like I get that our whole culture has changed so much as it relates to religion and church in the last, you know, 80 or a hundred years. But it did used to be the way that in that, um, that, that old time, it was the, it was the popular music, you know, that these Hank Williams song and him singing, I saw the light 
was not even thought to be uh, a particularly churchy song. It would have been on the radio. People would have been driving down the road in their pickup truck listening to this. I mean, I guess you could think of it as the CCM of a different time. Um, so just selfishly, as a nerdy music theory musician, playing CCM music, meaning playing it on the piano, it's not challenging. It's not fun. It's three or four chords over and over. It's repetitive. I just don't find it to be that culturally rich. So I just went with the stuff that I did think was more culturally rich. And I get, I totally get that it's not what a lot of people listen to. It's the furthest possible thing that it could that it could be from people who are listening to actual popular music, which to be, you know, to be honest, actual popular music for young yeah. people these days is hip hop. Right. It's not even it's not even rock and roll. I mean, rock and roll rock and roll hasn't been popular for like 20 years. I mean, Little it, Richard and Chuck Berry are dead. So, yeah. So let's there just goes rock and roll. hang it up. It's over. Yeah. Why? Why even try? You know, the interesting thing that I just thought of and, and that we haven't talked about, but it, it just came to mind. You know, when you were talking about these old hymns and people who are tuning in may know them. We think in the church that this live band and uh, cool production and stuff is the way to possibly one of the ways that we speak to people who are unchurched because that looks and sounds culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing I think about that is if we were really wanting to do something that people were familiar with, people know non-believers, people who don't know Jesus at all probably know amazing grace. Right. They we do that. We probably do that. know we how that great thou art. Yeah. Yeah. They probably know this little light of mine and it could be because that was at their, at a funeral they went to, or it was at the end of a movie that they really liked. Like one my favorite movie, Tommy Boy, Amazing Grace is in Tommy Boy. It's, you know, when yeah. Brian Dennehy dies, not for real, like he just did, but when he died in, you know, in the movie mm -hmm. and he's walking, and then Tommy Boy's walking down. Oh, he's dead too, Chris Farley. But you, you get the point. Yeah. Like they've, they've played that, that song. And I think. Or they know, don't, th or they don't like those songs, but their parents did, you know? Right. And yeah. They, and they know that mom and dad used to like that that him yeah. so they still kind of know it in the back of their mind yeah like is that is that something that we're missing as the church you know that's a rhetorical question right now i'm not suggesting mm -hmm. that we need to get into that but um one of the other things about the isolation congregation that i love is how you've collaborated uh with musicians from all over the country and so um, right. I want to show a clip. I, I think this is maybe collaboration at its best during this time. And again, a lot of work for, for very little benefit for you, but it's been a huge benefit for those who have seen it. So I want to show this uh, a little bit of uh, this song that you put together for one of the Isolation Congregation episodes. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, I want you to know that we are going to get through this together. I wish you joy, peace, and a very happy day. So all these people are in different places. Yep. My Lord. Different sides of the country. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, my lord. It's obviously the great you know, George Harrison too. I really wanna see you. Really wanna be with you. Really wanna see you, Lord, but it takes so long, my lord. Oh my lord. My lord. Yeah, my lord. Yeah, yo, yo, look. <laughs> Divided, we trip up. United, we stand. Excited, a plan. Ignited, a man who's enlightened can span the land. Where the rich get the upper hand and the poor get scraps on the sucker hand. I'm a sucker punch structure until it rupture in. Break to the upper man, we get a glimpse of the promised land. Yeah, for the comrade in combat, for the family praying that he come back. For the homeless and the hopeless and the jobless. Notice, I don't care what the market do, cause I know what my God can do. Such a great room. 
I don't care what the virus do, cause I know what my God can do, yeah, uh, time to go up and go up the level, erupt and show off the devil, who but a rebel, most heavy metal, the heck on the heck got the devil, we levy the pedal and keep keeping on for the people, the me he's good, yeah, he's really good, I move like a bingo, I hit fear no evil, yeah, oh, horns, right, So, yeah, and there is something, you know, something new and engaging going on, like, what, every 40 seconds or something. So it really captures you. There's a guy talking to you, welcoming you into this thing. And then there's this girl playing the violin. And then there's this rap guy that comes out. Now there's a horn section. There's all these things. It's like, what's going to happen next? Right. Well, we're not going to watch it. So you can watch it on YouTube. Um, you can go find that. Just search Dave Madden, my sweet lord. It'll be the first thing that comes up. I tried it earlier. So oh, good. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it's great. So, so that again, is... marrying this like culturally relevant thing with this great old, you know, Southern gospel kind of song, uh, with a with a rap in the middle of it. This is a great um, a great way to collaborate and bring all these different people together from wherever they are. Now, how long does it take to put that together, Dave? That is, it, it's just a a crushing amount of labor and time and work to make that happen. Um, it takes me a couple days after I finish one of those things to kind of re-fall in love with that song again. But by the time I'm done, I've heard it a thousand times. Everything with my computer has gone wrong. Uh, it's a it's a very, very difficult um, process to do. But as you see, it's really great. And yes, I can help your church do something like that too, but I'm very good and very expensive. <laughs> yeah you're gonna need a donor uh, a couple of a couple of comments i just want to address before we wrap up today um well first of all isolation congregation 10 30 a.m central time on sunday mornings on live on facebook on dave madden's facebook page yeah facebook.com backslash dave madden music and i'm just planning on continuing to do it you know for the foreseeable future we don't know when this whole the whole thing the whole pandemic is finally going to really let up it might let up a little bit and then come back and then let up and you know we're talking about a second third wave so in the meantime i plan on just continuing to to do it every sunday morning and i you know yes i'm frustrated by putting a big video together like that but the actual isolation congregation where i'm sitting there playing these hymns people are tuning in we're singing together i really i love that like i I look forward to it. I'm having fun while I'm doing it. I feel so much better. Um, I mean, my just my soul, my mind feels so much better after singing for an hour together with all these people. So yeah, please tune in. Yeah, tune in. It's a it's a great thing. There's a great kids moment with a guy named Mr. Will, who's mm -hmm. an awesome kids performer, and then uh, there's a miniature horse named yeah, Danger one. that lives on Dave's uh, property. So. Yeah, we he's, go. he's on there, which is Dang, awesome. Yeah, we'll have a miniature horse just about every week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's incredible. Um, hey, you know, there's a lot of talk about when churches get back together and they're singing. Are they going to be allowed to sing? You know, like no. they're saying that's one way that this virus spreads like crazy. Hmm. And, you know, how do we lead singing when others aren't supposed to be singing? Um you know, is, is it okay to do this performance piece? You know, one of, one of the things that the church has been arguing about forever is, well, it's not performance. It's not a performance. It's worship. And yeah. those of you who know me know, I think that argument is crap. I yeah, think I, we are always performing our craft. Yeah. As a musician, so I've, I'm never, not, I've never I'm not cared about up that, that perspective. Old argument. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, assuming that that's a junk perspective, yeah. but now we got a group of people in that we expect them to participate, but uh, you know, maybe the congregation's allowed to sing. They're just not comfortable because mm -hmm. they don't want to, you know, whatever. Like how, how do we, how do we do that? Like, are, are we expecting people to do too much musically? Like as, as musicians, what are, what's our role here? Uh, what I would do is as each person enters the church, you take them aside into like a, a room, you get them to sing scales, arpeggios. And if they pass the test, then they're, you know, like the top 10% of people, the best singers are allowed to sing in church. 
and all the people who and are not get, good at they, they're the ones who get a mask yeah <laughs> yeah I and mean, then everybody else isn't allowed to sing because they were never good in the first place and church music is all about <laughs> sounding as good as possible no um that would be amazing though <laughs> truly that would be amazing <laughs> You didn't make it. You didn't make it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Enjoy the music. They can this still help in. us. Yeah, no, it'll help us hit our 25%. But, capacity. but I've been in the choir for 20 years. Yeah, that was a mistake. Yeah, yeah. yeah we were meaning to talk to you about never, that. Never should have never should have been in there in the, in the first place, <laughs> to, be, to be honest. Um, man, that is a great question. I mean, yeah, because I've seen or I've started to read some of the studies about the actual science of the actual way that the droplets of, um, you know, how it's completely different to be running on an open air trail, uh, exercising outside versus a choir um, singing together for 60 minutes inside the same room. I mean, it's, it's a high danger. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I am, a, I am a trained epidemiologist, so let me give you my perspective on <laughs> Well, I think I think the the point there really is what you just said. Like, I think it's okay to not be okay at yeah. this moment in time. And as the church and as musicians, I think it's okay for us not to know. Um, you know, we try to control everything all the time as human beings, and I think at this point in time, that's probably okay to not know and to see what God can do in the midst of this whole deal. You know. Um, because we know that there's people on every end of the spectrum, right? There's people who are scared to death. There's people who think the whole thing is stupid. And then there's people in between who are trying to seek the knowledge and the know how to be safe, but still get on with their life. And I think, um, you know, it's probably just time that we're going to have to figure that out. Uh, Leah actually wrote in on the chat and she said, interesting to think that we've been competing uh, we were just, we just weren't as aware of it as, uh, or perhaps admitting it. And I think that that's, that's very true. You know, yeah. we, we, now we're more aware of the fact that we're competing because people can just click and leave and go somewhere else with impunity. Like they, they no one's looking at them weird when they get up during the message and they're like, what's wrong with that guy? Oh, I guess he's offended or I guess he's, but I just, I just closed the window. I'm going to go to another church. Yeah. And then if I don't like that church, I'm going to go to Best Buy and I'm going to shop, you know? Right. I, I guess I, I understand why people are put off by the idea that church would lower itself to competing with the wider secular culture. But, it, but it's true, you know, it's true either way. And um, man, it's always been, it's always been a pet peeve of mine when church leadership kind of poo poos pop rock and roll music and says, well, that's not what we do. Or they just kind of look down their nose at it. It's like, how dare you? You know, like you are, that's exactly, it's exactly what you're trying to do. Of course, that's what you're trying to do. You are emulating this secular culture. You're spending a lot of money to do it. And then turning around at the same time and saying, well, that's not what we do. We do this thing that's better. Like it, it's a it's a crazy maker because which is it yeah no, that's a great point maybe that's something that you know last week we talked about um creating a lens sticking to that lens you know what's important to you this is a great time to be doing those things evaluating those principles so that you don't contradict yourself and you don't become hypocritical on accident uh there's a great book uh called the accidental pharisee uh, and I, th I think it's Larry Osborne. I could be wrong about that. I have it somewhere in here. But anyway, it, it's fantastic talking about this. I was looking at my bookshelf, by the way. Um, the author's not sitting many, in my office. Many leather bound books. Yeah. Yeah. It smells of rich mahogany in here. Um, but there's there's a great point to that, you know, where we're we're not intentionally being hypocritical, but oftentimes we come across that way. So we need to be aware of that. Well, hey, we, we've hit an hour. We're, we're going to do some more of these, I think. And um, if you have topics that you want us to tackle on Church Next, please email us. Um, you can reach me at adam at countrymanconsulting.com. Um, you could email uh, Phil or Leah or any of those folks who have been on here in the past. We're going to be uh, continuing these, kind of like Dave said, with the um, 
with the isolation congregation, as long as there's a need right. and as long as people are getting something out of it, you know, we're going to keep doing it. So I hope to have Dave back soon and we'll talk more about music in the church. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll kind of hone in on some different topics and, um, some different things, but until then, um, Dave, you can, you can get a hold of Dave at, uh, Dave Madden music.com. Yep. And, um, you can contact him from there. That's also where you would go to download the isolation congregation song sheets and, um, and all of that kind of good stuff. So if you want to see what's going on there also, you know, 10 30 AM Sunday mornings on the Facebook page, uh, streaming live, or you can go watch them, uh, you know, afterwards there's, they're all up there still. Um, so you can go back and watch those. Uh, for more news and information and resources, uh, you can go to countrymanconsulting.com. And then, as always, check out the churchnext.online website. Uh, Phil Grimpo has been doing a lot of great webinars on the technical side of things, really nerding out with other nerds, talking about cameras and sound and things like that. But uh, Leah Abel's got some great ones coming up. And we're going to just keep the conversation going. So we're really, really uh, grateful for the opportunity and the technology to do that. We hope you all have a great day. Dave, do you have any uh, last words? just want to thank Phil and Adam for having me on. I miss you guys and look forward to when we finally get to be in the same room together, uh, hugging tightly for a little too long mm. and uh, making yeah. sweet, sweet music together. Thanks for having me. Amen. Good to see you guys. Thanks for being here. <laughs>